The series that we're in, you can see it on the screen there, I called Psalms for the New Year. And maybe by March we're like, hey, it's not a new year anymore. Uh, But my intent for Psalms for the New Year is that in my life, Psalms have been a playbook for stability and faith. Uh, They're inspired records of a right response right response to God, to almost anything life could throw at you. So what I was thinking in the new year, I find great hope for my future when I'm soaking in the Psalms. Psalm 105, our psalm for today, introduces us to, I would say, one of the most prevalent uh, themes in the book of Psalms. And so I'm going to read the first nine verses for you if you have a copy of God's Word, Psalm 105, verses 1 through 9. Give thanks to the Lord, call on His name, make known among the nations what He has done. Sing to Him, sing praises to Him, tell of all His wondrous acts. Glory in His holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always. Remember the wonders He has done, His miracles and the judgments He pronounced. O descendants of Abraham, His servants, O sons of Jacob, His chosen ones, He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers His covenant forever. The word he commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant he made with Abraham. The oath he swore to Isaac. If I could put the teaching of Psalm 105 in one sentence, it would go something like this. We are called to a God-focused memory that causes our mouths to boast about God and our hearts to to seek God. So we're called to a a God-focused remembering that causes our mouths to boast about God and our hearts to seek God. I'm going to start in the middle of that. A mouth that boasts about God. And I don't know that we use that word often, uh, boasting, you know, it's kind of looked down on in our society and it probably, well, no, I, I'll take that back. Boasting is very popular in our society. We all pretend that we don't want to boast. <laughs> we, all tr- we all try to look humble, uh, but uh, really people are prone to boast, but this is the best kind of boasting, boasting about God. Verse 3 says, to glory in His name. And sometimes, in some translations, that word glory gets translated as boast. Boast in the name of God. And that's a theme that's prevalent in the psalm. You might have heard it. Give thanks, make known, sing to Him. And then there's also, uh, in terms of singing to make known His wonders, so sing about Him. And kind of the summary phrase is glory in His name. Boast about your God. And then the psalmist spends the rest of the psalm, 36 verses, doing exactly that. He practices what he's preaching. So I'm going to leave the the detailed reading of Psalm 105 to you and encourage you to do that later uh, today and to look for the things that I'm saying there. But I want to summarize those 36 verses and try to emphasize what I believe is the psalmist's main thrust. So this is the material the psalmist covers in the next 36 verses. God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob land, but after three generations, the family was still a small band of strangers with no place to call home. So God protected them. In fact, God rebuked kings for their sake, God sent a man before them into Egypt, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. God proved Joseph true in Egypt and promoted him from prison to palace. God called down a famine to get Israel into Egypt. And then God multiplied his people even when the Egyptians oppressed them. 
God chose and God sent Moses and Aaron in order to do God's miraculous signs in front of Pharaoh. All those signs, or not all of them, but most of the signs are listed in the psalm. Darkness, water into blood, frogs, swarms of flies, hail, locust, and then it says God caused them all. Finally, God struck down the firstborn of all Egypt, and God brought Israel out of Egypt strong and rich. God shaded them with a cloud by day and uh, illuminated their way with fire by night. God brought them quail, and God satisfied them with bread from heaven in the desert where there was no food to be found. God opened a rock and gave them water and quenched their thirst. And because God remembered his covenant, God brought his people in and God gave them the lands of other nations. Praise the Lord, boast in the Lord. Now, I don't know if you picked up on the most, uh, the word that I use the most there, uh, but maybe as Christians, we've gotten too used to how the Psalms speak, how the Bible speaks, and we don't realize how outrageous this kind of speech is. I don't know all the countries of origin that we have uh, here. I know we have uh, a contingent of Canadians and we have U.S. citizens and uh, we have South Africans. I wasn't going to forget the South Africans, Michael. Uh, You know, we've had Latvians and we've had uh, people from all over the world here. What if we had a, a testimony time and each country got to pick one representative and they came up here and their job was to give their history, the history of their country for the past 500 years. And they were allowed to list a few of the men and women who made it into their history books, but they had to tell the story in such a way that in the entire story, the only person who got any credit, the only person that was boasted about was God. <laughs> that That's what the author of Psalm 105 does, he boasts for 36 years, he talks about 500 years of uh, Israel's history from the time that Abraham was called until the time they came back in, came into the promised land. He talks about all of that and he lists a few of the, the, the key leaders, but the person who gets all the glory, the central character of the history, well, it's his story. It's about God. He's the key character. Now, we don't do history that way. In fact, history that way is frowned on uh, out in academia. And to an extent, that's okay because it could get presumptuous, right? I don't have uh, the divine 30,000-foot view of what God has been doing in the United States. I can look back and I and certainly believe that God has and is working in my country. He's worked in the history of my country. But I don't have the inspired perspective of exactly how. I don't have the road map that the psalmist did. The psalmist um, knew that God had promised a land and he could see that God gave a land to his people. And so when he looked back at everything between those two points, the promise and the delivery, the Holy Spirit prompted him to write, God protected, God sent, God proved, God multiplied, God chose, God caused, God struck down, God brought, God shaded, God illuminated, God satisfied, God opened. God. Glory in God. So the psalmist had a God-directed memory. The fact that he was inspired by the Holy Spirit when he was writing these words doesn't negate at all the fact that he was looking for God's hand in his story, in history. And that's what I mean by a God-directed memory, a mind set apart to God, a, a mind that studies the Word and the world and expects to see evidence that God has been at work that God is working. That's what this psalm encourages. And unless you as a believer have a mind to do that, you're not going to be very prone to give thanks, 
to make known, to sing about, uh, to sing to him, to boast in his name. Those actions, if they're genuine, spring from a God-directed memory. I was talking with Randy about this earlier. I, you know, again, we didn't coordinate this, but Randy, as a guest uh, speaker this morning, uh, he didn't use those terms, but he kept talking about what God had done, what he'd seen God do in John and Bianca's lives, because he knows them really well. And he talked about what God had done in his life. It was very, it was mem- there were a lot of memories in what he shared, but they were God-directed. Look at what God has done. Look what God has done in my life, in the lives of those that I know. If we are trained to look for what God has done in our lives and to keep it in mind, we're going to sing about Him. We're going to praise Him. We're going to make known. We're going to boast in His name. Those actions spring from a God-directed memory. When you put the Psalms phrases back together, you can see how the praise flows from memory. You probably didn't catch it the first time I read it, but give thanks to the Lord, make known among the nations what He has done. The psalmist is looking backwards. Sing to Him, sing praises to Him, tell of all His wonderful acts, glory in His holy name. Remember the wonders He has done, His miracles and the judgments He pronounced. It's all past tense. But the, the, the current praise is coming from looking back at what God has done. Now, this has been, if you've been listening, this has been a theme in our, our psalms, but I'm just, I really want to count, uh, camp on it today. Is that how your memory works? Is it directed towards God? Is it saturated with what God has been doing in your lives? Um, the answer is yes, whether you realize it or not. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, If you've embraced Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord and the the only way to come into the presence of a holy God, you have engaged your memory in this way. You might not do it consciously, but no one can confess, I am saved, without looking back on the work of God through our Savior. No one can say, I am saved, without at the same time confessing, God promised a Savior, and God delivered a Savior. God promised deliverance, and He delivered me. It, it has to be in our memories. God made promises in Jesus Christ, and He made good on those promises. We're going to end the service by singing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And we sing it because we have testimonies in our own life of God's faithfulness to us. And we have testimonies not just in the book of Psalms, but on page after page, chapter after chapter, of God's great faithfulness to His world and to His people. We're also celebrating communion today. So that is together focusing our memories backwards. Backwards faith. Focusing our memories on God's gift of grace and His forgiveness in Jesus Christ. I mean, just think about the take, eat. This is the communion of the Lord's body given for you at Calvary. Take, drink. This is the new covenant in His blood shed for you on the cross. This story is your story. History is his story, but this story is your story. All the way back to the promise of Abraham, because it wasn't just a promise of land. God promised Abraham, in your seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. And the New Testament makes it clear that Jesus Christ is the seed that was talked about in that promise. And in, in him, all nations have been blessed. You have been blessed. So one of the reasons I encourage you to know this book uh, I, I won't even apologize for how many times I've told you to get into your Bibles. I, I'm Ad nauseum, on purpose. Be in the Word, reading it daily. It is God's number one tool to sanctify your mind. Jesus prayed 
for his disciples in John 17, and it, it actually says at the beginning of that prayer, Jesus says, I'm not just praying for these men, but I'm praying for all who will come to faith by their ministry. So that includes you. Jesus prayed in John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So when we're in the words, God sanctifies us. He sets us apart for his good purposes. And one of the things he does is he transforms our mind. He keeps us from being shoved into the mold of this world, but he conforms our mind to his ways and his desires. And we get a a glimpse of how he has worked in the world. So we get a pattern for how he has worked among his people. How he has worked in your world. Reading the Word will help you recognize how He's worked in your world. That's right. This is personal. It's not just about all the stuff He did in these pages. God is still writing His story. And I don't mean that you get to add your chapter to the back of my Bible. Uh, Not in the same way, but God is writing His story in your lives. And uh, when you read the Old Testament, you go, Oh, (laughs) why do I have to read another genealogy? Every one of those people was a special person in God's plan. He knew them by name. He had a place for them. He had a purpose for them. He he did something with them in his plan of salvation, and that hasn't quit. His name, your name, is written in his book of life. And uh, maybe one of the glories of eternity will be getting to read some of that together and giving him glory, boasting in his name. So be in the book. Uh, start to train your mind to see God's gracious pattern with his people. That will enable you to better recognize, to truly recognize in your own life. And it will prime you to give thanks, to make known, to sing to him, to sing about him, and to glory in his name. So I said this psalm teaches us to have a God-focused memory that causes our mouths to boast about him, and our hearts to turn to him. So we've been talking about boasting about him. What about our hearts to turn to him? Well, seeing how God has graciously, mercifully worked in our own circumstances is supposed to be part of what drives us to seek him earnestly. Here's where I see that in in the psalm, verse 3 and 4. So right in the middle of encouragements to remember and talk about God's past goodness, the the psalmist says, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. So that's not memory. Seeking is present and future. Why should those who seek the Lord be joyful? Because when they sought him in the past, he was found. And uh, his faithfulness was proven. And it was proven that he is worth finding. Why look to the Lord and his strength? Why not look to our own strength? That was another question that came up this morning in in, uh, our Bible fellowship. Why not look to our own strength? I mean, we're good, self-sufficient people. We've been taught that in our society. We've been taught to achieve and to conquer and, and to uh, name it and claim it and to get out there and do it. Why not rely on our own strength? I don't know how many times I'm going to have to learn this in my life. Maybe as many times as Israel had to learn it. <laughs> that 500-year history of Israel really their entire history, could be written from another very sad vantage point. And you know this if you read your Bible. All the times that they decided to look to their own strength. All the times that they decided to look to a foreign ally for deliverance. All the times they thought, well, maybe Baal is a better God than Yahweh. And they fell flat on their faces and their enemies rode their chariots over them. They were in the dust. But even then, it's a story of God's grace as they turned back to God and they received restoration and reconciliation and blessing. God in His infinite mercy continuing to to lead them and love them. So the lesson we learn from a God-directed memory is seek His face. Always. 
Looking backwards in faith makes me look forward in faith. (laughs) Gives me reasons to keep looking for God's goodness in my world. What does it mean to seek someone's face? It's a a Hebrew idiom. It's a, a form of speech. The other day I got a text I was trying to get together with a guy to look for a car to replace one of our, our burned up cars. And the guy, I, I, I asked the guy, you know, would Monday morning work for you? And he texted back and I translated it and it said, yes, but kiss me quickly. <laughs> and I phoned a friend. I'm like, I'm not getting in a car with this guy until I know what... <laughs> what that idiom means. And so I texted John Fowler and and he said, oh, it means uh, like yes and right away, but let me know right away. So sometimes idioms don't always translate. What does it mean to seek someone's face? It means to get into their presence. If you're going to seek the face of the king, you want to get into his presence. You want an audience with the king. And that's what uh, we're being encouraged to do here. Get into God's presence. Now, we don't seek God because He's gone anywhere. He's never left us. In His Son, He's promised never to leave us or forsake us. In fact, when Jesus left the earth, He promised a helper who would dwell with us and in us. And so it's, we don't seek God because He's left us. We seek His face. We purpose to do that uh, because it's so easy for us to lose sight of his face, to get out of his presence. God doesn't get lost, but boy, do I get lost. You might have noticed when I'm standing with my wife that she's just a little smaller in stature. And she's just enough smaller that if she's behind me, sometimes I lose her. And I look over this shoulder and I look over this shoulder and I don't see her. And I'm like, she was just there. Where did she go? I call it poodling because I used to have a poodle that would do that. And I'm like, where's that dog? And I'm not making any comparison there at all. I need to stick to my notes sometimes a little better. Um, Sue gets lost, not because she's gone anywhere. In fact, sometimes she's so close to me that if I stopped walking, she'd run into me. I'm just not looking in the right direction. Now, that is a flawed uh, illustration when it comes to God because it's certainly not because of the size of God that we lose sight of Him. We're just looking in the wrong direction sometimes. Sometimes. And I'll tell you uh, from personal experience how to get out of the presence of God or how to lose sight of His face. Every time that I have neglected reading about His goodness and faithfulness in His Word, when I neglect remembering how good He's been to me, how faithful He's been to me, I stop seeing His daily goodness and mercy to me. I start seeing other things that look more attractive and people that seem to be prospering who maybe aren't walking with God or whatever. And I start feeling sorry for myself. And then other gods, idols, things of the world start looking more attractive and more fulfilling to me than the love of my life, Jesus Christ. So if I fail to feed my memory on what God has done and and look for His goodness in my life, it's really easy for me to get out of His presence, disconnected from Him, and and get off on the, the wrong foot, the wrong track, to fall in the ditch. Isaiah says, I believe it's Isaiah, talks about God's people. It's actually God talking. He says, my people have committed two sins. They've forgotten me the spring of living water. And they've dug for themselves broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And that's my testimony. When I turn away from the spring of living water, I'm drinking mud. (laughs) I'm drinking out of a a dry place that can never satisfy me. So how's your memory? Is it God-saturated? How do you reminisce? How do you recount your life? If somebody gets a chance with you and they ask you about your life, what's that sound like? Uh, is, is there any echo of God in what you say? Or is it the fill in your name, the show, the John Wizardi show? 
And everything's about your glory and your life and what you've done. How is your memory? How, is it God-focused? Is it God-saturated? Do they hear anything about God? Or are you the star? Psalm 105 calls us to a God-directed, God-saturated memory that causes our mouths to boast about Him and our hearts to seek His face. So I'm going to challenge you to do something. Go home this afternoon or sometimes this week. Uh, This afternoon would be better before you forget about it. Um, And look back in your life. Maybe you've done this, but it's always good to do. Look back over your life. Places where God has obviously blessed or rescued or sent comfort to you. You could read the psalm, Psalm 105, and look for those prompts. You could... You could write these out. God protected, God sent, God proved, God multiplied, God chose, God caused, God brought, God shaded, God illuminated, God satisfied, God opened. Just put those out as ticklers and then try to fill in the blanks behind them. Times when you've seen God work in your life. Write down some of your own history with God. Praise Him for it. And then take it to another step and tell someone else about it. And you go, oh, that's where it gets really hard for me. I don't want to talk to any, you know, I, I just, it's, it's hard to make that transition and, and have that conversation. Come tell me. You'll have a great audience. <laughs> I would love to hear your story. Write it down and send it to me. And if I get enough, if I get an indication that there are just lots of people out there, we'll have a, a testimony night where we get to share our, what God has done in our history. And we'll sing praises to him and we'll tell the wonders of his name together. And I guarantee it will be encouraging to your faith. I'm just going to do a little bit of this. Two friends and I were rafting down the Iowa River. I'm not a swimmer. I'm not great in the water. I I grew up in Kansas. That should tell you enough. There is no water. So um, we're rafting down the Iowa River. And when we got in, they told us, don't worry. It's nowhere. It's no more than three deep, three foot deep anywhere. They didn't take into account that it had been raining solid for a week. So we came around the corner. There was one uh, canoe ahead of us, and I heard this roar, and it was another river cutting sideways into the Iowa River. And as soon as we hit that, it flipped our canoe. I was down underwater, and I'll tell you, it was deeper than three feet because I could just barely see a person extended above me, and I wasn't touching the bottom. And I lost all of my air screaming underwater, God help, because I thought I was going to drown, because I I can't even swim to save my life sometimes. I got up to the service finally, said it again through gasps, Lord help. The water was so strong, it pushed us over against the bank, and I got a hold of some roots to hang on to, and was holding the canoe, and the undertow going against the bank was so strong, it was pulling my shoes off, just to give you an idea. And I'm praying, God help, I'm going to drown out here. This is going to be the end of my young life. I was uh, somewhere in the sophomore age range. And here comes an old bald-headed guy swimming through this. And he stops in the water. He's treading water somehow. Or there's a submerged bank. I don't know about it. I don't know. But he helped me pick the canoe. I'm still grasping the, the roots. He helped me pick that canoe up. And then he held it while we all got in and went on our way. And about the same time, all three of us went, wait a minute. And we looked back and we couldn't see the guy anywhere. Now, can, I didn't see his credentials. I don't know if he was an angel. Can, can a, an older, really built, bald-headed guy with a Swedish accent, is that an angel's cover story? I don't know. <laughs> all I know is that day, God delivered. God sent a deliverer. I, about not long after that, I was languishing in a hospital with severe arrhythmia. They couldn't do anything with medicine to stop it. Again, I'm a teenager. And the doctor came in and he said, your heart's supposed to function like one muscle, but right now the bottom part is going like 200 beats a minute and the top part is only occasionally beating. It's like they're two separate muscles. And we need to get that reunited. And we've done everything we can with medicine. So we're going to shock your heart and re- stop it and restart it. And he said, one of the side effects could be death. I mean, he didn't say it. He was about that subtle. He left, 
And uh, my mom said, I think we should pray. I'm like, yeah, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> and uh, I was eager to pray. But instead of praying, she uh, pulled out a daily devotional that came from our denomination. And she opened it up. And the verse for that day was Psalm 86, 11. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I might fear your name. And I knew instantly I was going to be okay. The doctor came back in 15 minutes to prep me and my, all my vitals were normal. They said, you're going to be on medicine the rest of your life. I haven't been on medicine. They said, never go to a high, never go to high altitudes. I've climbed mountains. You know, don't ever do anything uh, exhaustive or, you know. And God has just kept me. He healed me. More than just healing me, my physical heart, as I got to know that psalm, I realized how divided my spiritual heart was. I was teaching Sunday school on Sunday morning and living like the devil the rest of the week, doing whatever I wanted with my friends. My heart for God was divided. And through that circumstance, he gave me a desire to have a whole heart, to be wholeheartedly serving and following him. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts of glory. Boast about his holy name. Maybe you've got some amazing stories like that in your life. Or maybe you think you don't. You go, well, I don't think God's ever physically rescued me. I, don't, I can't say that he healed my sick heart or my sick anything else. Let me remind you of our story as we turn to communion. He has, res he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Colossians chapter 1. When you were dead in your sins, God made you alive with Christ. Colossians 2. He Himself, this is talking about Jesus Christ, He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By His wounds you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. 1 Peter 2. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. It's rare that anyone will die for a righteous man, though for a good man some might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died died for us. You have an awesome history with God, if you'll just remember it. Let's pray together as we turn our hearts towards communion. Give thanks to the Lord, call on His name, make known among the nations what He has done, sing to Him, sing praise to Him, tell of all His wonderful acts, glory in His holy name. Father, we just confess that there are so many things we glory in. It, it's embarrassing sometimes to me to think we glory in new kitchen appliances. We glory in sports teams. We glory in the newest make and model of car. We glory in the, the latest financial thing that's come along. We talk to everybody about it. We, we find some vitamin that helps us and we glory in it and we proclaim it to all the nations and we tell what it has done for us and then we're silent about what you've done for us and your glory and your faithfulness and so father i pray that one of the things that you would do today is at least give us the memory that we're supposed to remember what you've done in our lives and sing praises in our own hearts to you and sing praises together as a people and to gather and worship in a way that people see it and to live our lives out loud in a way that people know that 
Jesus Christ is the center and core of our existence. Father, his sacrifice is, is too great. His, to, to have us just a little changed and, and never getting to that place where we realize that our history is his story. I can't do that, Father. I can't harangue people. I can't coerce people. I can't use great words to talk them into that. But your word and your spirit can cause that revolution in our lives. And I pray that you would. For your glory, for boasting in your name, and for the sake of lost people who need to know that there's something more to this world. We pray these things and uh, let the redeemed of the Lord say, Amen.